So, this is a follow-up video to an earlier video I did about uh, Don Marquis's anti-abortion argument. Um, so I'm not going to go into too much detail summarizing Marquis's uh, basic argument, which um, originated in this 1989 um, article called uh, Why Ab Abortion is Wrong. Um, basically, the key ideas, uh, this one is kind of unstated, but it is important. The wrong of killing is the inflicting the harm of death. Now, you might think this is obvious, but um, it's not necessarily what a lot of people think. Uh, so, for example, if you're religious, you probably think the wrong of killing, like any wrong, is disobeying God's laws. And it doesn't matter whether or not it has an effect on a victim. Well, obviously, it has to have an effect on a victim to count as killing. But uh, doing something to somebody else is not what makes it wrong. It's doing something that God forbids. So that would disagree with this claim. Um, and normally we would say that's, that's totally obvious, like the wrong of assault is the harm that it inflicts on the victim that you assault. Um, you know, if you just punch the air, you're not doing anything wrong. So clearly it's the effect on whoever you hit that makes it wrong. That seems obvious. But what makes it weird in the case of death is that uh, as Epicurus shows, uh, the ancient Greek philosopher, it's kind of hard to pin down what exactly the harm of death is because you cease to exist and therefore can't be harmed. So here's, here's the puzzle, Epicurus. Uh, uh, Epicurus argued that de death is not a harm to us, so you shouldn't fear it. He said um, uh, fearing death was one of the things that made people's lives miserable for no good reason. And he said, look, Stop fearing death, because when it comes, you are beyond harm. Uh, there is no overlap between your existence and death. You cease to exist at the moment you die, and therefore you're immune to harm. You can't be harmed, so don't worry about it. So uh, the challenge for somebody to say, okay, there is a harm of death, the Epicurean says, is, okay, when is there a harm of death? You've got basically two options, either before you're dead, when you can be harmed. Obviously, I can be harmed now, but how can be, I be harmed by my death when I'm still alive? So that doesn't seem right. Or the other alternative is after you're dead. That's when you're harmed. And that seems wrong either. You know, if you're going to harm me, please do it after I'm dead because I won't give a shit, right? Because I won't exist. Um, so either option seems weird. And that's something that uh, Marquis never gets into. He just says, well, there obviously there is a harm of death, and the harm of death is the loss of a future like ours. So when you kill somebody, the harm that you're inflicting is robbing them of a future like ours. Now, in the previous video, I go into how to flesh that out in terms of what's called the deprivation account of the, the um, harm of death. And I, I don't buy it. I, it has all kinds of problems, but you know, a lot of people do, so let's not question that now. Um, so the basic idea is killing somebody is wrong because you rob them of a future. And Marquis says, okay, now we've established what makes killing wrong in any circumstance. What falls out of this account is, oh, killing an embryo is also wrong because you're robbing the embryo of a future like ours. Now, what he says, he sees that there are advantages to this account. And there are advantages um, if you have kind of liberal sympathies, or what are nowadays called liberal, they're not essentially liberal. That is, if you believe that conscious life is more valuable than mere biological life. So, for example, if you believe that somebody whose uh, cerebrum it has stopped working, There's, it's had a massive brain bleed, or uh, an anencephalic child who is born without a cerebrum, incapable of any kind of experience. If you believe that that human life is not inherently valuable, and that if you kill, um, uh, you kill humans that are incapable of consciousness or experience of any kind, it's not wrong in the way that killing someone like me or you would be, um, 
then Marquis says, hey, I'm on your side. Because what I say, a future like ours, what makes it valuable is being able to have experiences. So for example, if you kill uh, a mosquito, let's assume you're, you're ending a life, but not one that can have a future like ours because it can't have experiences. It's too simple an organism. So life in itself is not valuable, says Marquis. And, and in that, he disagrees with, say, Catholics or people like that. So his anti-abortion argument is supposed to be interesting because it's supposed to appeal to people who are normally pro-choice, who say, no, 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 um, you know, fetuses, it's not wrong to kill them because they're not conscious. And he says, sure, they're not conscious, but they have a future like ours where they are conscious. And uh, Marquis actually compares a fetus to a temporarily unconscious adult. You know, imagine someone's in a coma for nine months. Marquis would say, well, there's no difference between that person and a fetus. For nine months, they're incapable of consciousness, but they're going to be conscious in the future. So that's his argument. His argument is that abortion turns out to be wrong because you're killing something that has a future like ours. And it's wrong in exactly the same way that killing an adult is, because in both cases, the wrong of what you're doing is depriving someone of a future where they can have conscious experiences. Okay, um, there are several points to make about this. One thing is, is Marquis could be entirely right. He could show all of this and succeed. His argument could succeed. And it still wouldn't show necessarily that abortion should be illegal because of a famous argument by Judith Jarvis Thompson where she, says, where she says, even if the fetus had all the rights of an adult human being, abortion should still be legal. Um, and, uh, you know, I've talked about this in other videos. It's a well-known argument. Uh, a contemporary philosopher, uh, Thompson just died a few years ago, um, a, a living philosopher, David Boonin, um, pointed out, he wasn't the first to do this, but he, he wrote a book about it, that uh, a, an actual U.S. case, the case of McFall versus Shimp, sides with Thompson. In the case of McFall versus Shimp, um, McFall uh, is dying and can be saved probably by a bone marrow transplant. And his cousin turns out, his distant cousin who he's never met, Shimp, turns out to be a match. Uh, and Shimp says, no, I don't want to donate it, uh, even though donating bone marrow is, you know, an outpatient procedure, and it would save McFall's life. So McFall uh, sues and say, asks the court to compel Shimp to donate his bone marrow, and the court says, no, of course we can't do that. Sure, Shimp's being an asshole, and he should, he morally should donate um, bone marrow to save you, but the law absolutely cannot compel him because he's an individual and you can't compel individuals it violates uh, individual bodily integrity. So that argument uh, appears to back up Thompson's claim that says even if we could say it's wrong to have an abortion, it absolutely should be legal to ha have an abortion. And nothing Marquis says would undercut that. But let's, let's, uh, let's look at the strengths of, does Marquis even show that abortion is wrong? Marquis certainly doesn't show that abortion should be illegal, but does Marquis show that abortion is wrong? Well, um, there's something pretty weird about this idea that the harm of uh, killing is depriving of a future, because this future thing seems rather vague and metaphysical. And there's an immediate problem that uh, it doesn't explain, even if his, his theory works, it doesn't explain what's wrong about killing someone who's very old. Um, there's uh, the, the largest serial murderer in British history was uh, a male nurse who killed, I think, hundreds of people in hospitals, and nobody noticed or cared because they were old until he finally got caught. Um, so basically, they figured oh, they would have died anyway. So he got away with it, and he killed hundreds of people. Um, you know, according to Marquis's theory, it, it can't explain what was wrong, because let's assume that they had no future, that they, that they were going to die in a short space of time. Well, 
he didn't, what this serial killer didn't do is deprive them of a future like ours because they didn't really have one. But clearly we think that that's wrong and I think it's wrong in exactly the same way as killing me or you would be. So whereas Marquis has to say, well, my account can't explain what's wrong with that, but there must be another account that can explain it. My account just explains what's wrong with some uh, deaths, but not all of them. But if you have the intuition, look, your account of what's wrong in killing should apply to all killings, then Marquis's theory immediately falls down. A worse problem for Marquis's theory is if it says that certain things are wrong that we say, no, 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 that's not wrong. So, for example, it appears, Marquis's theory appears to say that some forms of contraception are as bad as killing an adult. Because imagine, imagine I have, uh, I can control a miniature submarine inside a woman's uterus and there is a, a sperm about to fertilize an egg and I drive my little miniature submarine between the sperm and egg and prevent them from meeting. That sperm-egg pair had a future like mine if I hadn't done that because they would, let's assume, they would have uh, immediately become uh, a zygote and the zygote would have become an embryo and the embryo would have become a fetus and the fetus would have uh, been born. So if I hadn't prevented the meeting, um, they would have had a future. So it appears that Marquis's theory has to say that what I did in that kind of science fiction-y contraception was equivalent to just going out and shooting so, uh, some uh, person in the street in the head and watching them die. That just doesn't wash. Nobody's going to buy that. So therefore, if his theory has that implication, it appears that reveals that his theory must be wrong. Um, now, Mark Quist tries to reply to this, but his reply is stupid and doesn't work. I mean, honestly, even his defenders kind of, uh, kind of agree with that. However, recently, um, Mark Quist died uh, about, I don't know, uh, less than 10 years ago, uh, but, you know, he's, he's dead now. He doesn't have a future like ours anymore. But, there are people who want to kind of def defend a version of Marquis's argument, and they think the solution to defending this argument is to commit to a view called animalism. Now, animalism sounds uh, racier than it, it, it is. Uh, it's actually a metaphysical view, and it's a view about personal identity, and I've got a bunch of videos about it, and including an entire video on a, a paper by uh, Jeff McMahon and uh, a guy called Campbell uh, going over what's wrong with animalism, talking about varieties of conjoined twinning, and we'll get into why that's important in a second. But animalism is essentially the idea that we, you, me, everybody, is essentially an organism. Again, like this, that sounds like common sense. Well, except if you're familiar with uh, the debates about personal identity. The debates about personal identity that have been going on since uh, John Locke in the 1700s. And John Locke famously gives this example where he imagines a prince and a cobbler swapping consciousnesses. Basically, it's Freaky Friday, okay? Freaky Friday, they swap consciousnesses. Now, Locke asks, okay, which one is which? Where's the prince now? And everybody, I would say 99 out of 100 people, say that the prince now is in the cobbler's body. Why is this against animalism? Because if you're an animalist, you would have to say essentially nothing's happened. The, the prince is still the one that looks like the prince, except now he's confused and he thinks he's a cobbler. But that one's the prince because you are the organism, not anything psychological. It seems that we have, uh, given my experience uh, asking students about this, it seems that all of us have much more what is called personalist intuitions. We think we are where the consciousness or psychological features go. And that's a very powerful intuition. 
and animalism rejects that. So, for example, imagine um, my body is riddled with cancer, but my brain is okay. Uh, and it's the near future, and they've got uh, a donor body. Somebody, somebody uh, had a terrible cerebrum accident, and their, their brain, their, their, the part of their brain that is responsible for consciousness is gone. So they are a donor um, possibility because, you know, their life, according to what Marquis would agree, isn't valuable anymore because they can't have experiences. So there's this donor body waiting that lacks a cerebrum. And I, uh, these amazing doctors, take the cerebrum from my head, leaving my cancer-ravaged body behind, and place the cerebrum in this other body. And that body opens its eyes and has all of my memories because they, they're stored in my cerebrum. Why just the cerebrum? Well, the, the brain stem, you might say, controls, regulates um, bodily functions. But any brain stem will do, and it can still be me. What makes me me, according to uh, most personalists, is my consciousness and my memories and my experiences. So as far as I'm concerned, I wake up in a new body. Animalism has to deny that. Animalism has to say, no, you are the uh, now cerebrum-less cancer-ridden body because that's the organism uh, and the organism can't be simply the brain. So animalism has to reject that that is possible. But I think just about everybody, except very few people, would, would deny, everybody would agree that that's me in the body where I go where my cerebrum goes. And again, animalism has to reject that. So animalism has it has a, some defenders, but they, what they defend it on, and a famous uh, example of this is a guy called Eric Olson, who's a very smart guy. I've got an interview with him. I'll put a link in the, uh, underneath the video. Um, uh, he, his reasons for being an animalist are kind of technical, philosophical arguments. They're not that his view uh, defends anti-abortion. He doesn't even think animalism necessarily implies anti-abortion. He says, yes, you were a fetus, but that doesn't mean it's wrong to kill all fetuses. He thinks it's perfect, his view is perfectly compatible with being pro-choice. Um, so uh, there are disadvantages. You know, if you're believing in animalism, it better be for the right reasons, whereas these uh, defenders of Marquis are only hopping on board the animalism tra train because they think it can solve a problem for Marquises. That's kind of a shitty reason for committing yourself to a, a view about what we are. Um, another problem with animalism is it appears to say that conjoined twins with two different uh, heads, like famously the Hensel twins, um, are just one individual. Why? Because it's one organism. Uh, they have uh, mostly one set of organs. So, you know, if you shot the Hensel twins in the heart, it would kill, we would say, both of them. They view themselves as two different individuals who happen just to share some organs. Whereas it looks like animalism has to say, no, 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 they're one organism. They can't be two different individuals. They are essentially the same organism, so, you know, they can't be... Uh, they can't be two people. Now, they've got a reply to that, um, but uh, Marquis, I'm sorry, uh, McMahon and Campbell uh, sh uh, really rip that uh, answer to shreds in this one article, uh, and I've got the video on it, so you can look into that. Finally, uh, cyborgs. Well, what is a cyborg? A cyborg is a combination of um, biological and, uh, and artificial stuff. Imagine, again, um, I'm, my body is riddled with cancer, but they, they haven't got a donor body. So what they do is they replace each of my organs with an artificial um, replacement, like they can do with hearts. I mean, Dick Cheney has an artificial heart. Plenty of people have artificial hearts. They're walking around without a heartbeat because artificial hearts just have a steady pump. Um, and, you know, they're going to come up with artificial versions of all the organs eventually. So imagine all of my organs, ev basically everything from 
the neck down, and maybe even my brain stem gets replaced with an artificial analog. All that's left that from the original is the cerebrum. I'm basically plastic except from my cerebrum. Have I survived? I would say yes. If you talk to me, you'd say, of course I've survived. I remember everything. I remember each, uh, after each operation, I remember waking up and saying, okay, now I've got a new heart. Now I've got new lungs. Now I've got new kidneys. Uh, whereas animalism, I have to say, no, at some point, uh, there wasn't enough biologically for you to count as an organism, so you cease to exist. So it looks like animalism combined with Marquis would say there's nothing wrong in, in killing a cyborg because uh, the person that I was ceased to exist at some point. Or at least uh, there's, uh, I no longer exist. There, there's two different lives at least. Uh, and I'm not even alive at all. There isn't a person there. There isn't an individual there if there isn't an organism, says animalism. So that's problems with animalism just by itself. There's also problems with the combination of Marquis and animalism. First of all, why would you do this? How does, how does adding animalism solve a problem for Marquis? Well, the answer is it says, oh, the sperm egg pair don't count contraception, the sperm and egg aren't yet an organism, so if you prevent the meeting, you haven't, uh, you haven't prevented a future like ours. Now you might say, but wait a minute, they do have a future like ours because in a second, unless, uh, uh, if I hadn't intervened with my miniature submarine, um, they would have become a zygote, so of course the sperm egg together have a future, in the same way that you know, you might say, well, they're not, there's two of them. How can they have a single future? Well, the Beatles could have a single future. Our family could have a single future. We're, we're well used to the idea, my arms and my legs together have a future as part of me. It doesn't matter that there's, there's two of them because there's exactly the amount of genetic material before they meet as after they meet. So if after they meet, the zygote has a future, it looks like before they meet, they have a future. Well, they, the reason animalism blocks that is they say, well, has a future means, uh, the way we've been understanding before is has a future means will become. So if something will become uh, uh, something that can have conscious experiences, then it has a future like ours. That's the old way of understanding has a future. Whereas if you add animalism, you say, no, has a future means is one and the same organism as the thing that would have experiences. And you can say that the sperm and egg are not one and the same organism. Now, I think you could question this. I think you could say, you could say the definition of organism is so vague that maybe a sperm egg pair counts as an organism. But I don't want to get into that. Let's say they're right. Okay, so this blocks the sperm egg objection. So you can say, now we've got a new theory that doesn't have this bad implication that contraception is murder. So now we've got a, a more plausible theory. Well, there's some, it, maybe it solves that problem, but at the cost of adding all the problems of animalism, because uh, Marquis probably wouldn't like this because he wanted his theory to appeal both to animalists and people who rejected animalism. He says, I don't have to make any commitments about personal identity for my argument to work against abortion. Now we've lost that. Now we're saying, okay, we're setting up camp in this one rather small camp in personal identity. Uh, so we've lost all the people who disagree with animalism. So the appeal of this new argument is much narrower right away. But also it has even if it doesn't imply that contraception is murder, it seems to imply that twinning is as bad as death. Why? Because of this idea of you have to be one and the same organism as. So let me explain this. When twinning happens, like in identical twins, um, you start by having a, a zygote or an embryo and it splits. So you start by having one and then you have two and they're identical because you, they have the same DNA and everything because you had one and, and it split. So these were originally both part of this. Now, 
are these one and the same organism with this? Well, obviously not, because B and C are two different individuals. Uh, if you've met any twins, often they hate each other. I, I've met identical twins that really don't like each other. So these are not the same individuals. So B is not C. Well, if B is not C, then it can't be the case that A is the same as B and B, uh, A is the same as C. Because if A equals B and A equals C, then B equals C. That, that would follow. But because B does not equal C, it can't be the case that A equals B and A equals C. So either you have to say that A equals B but does not equal C, in which case where did C come from, or you have to deny, which is what the general consensus is, you have to say that A is not the same as B or C. So what that means is that A no longer exists. So you could say what uh, the new version, the Marquis plus animalism argument would have to say A did have a future like ours, but it lost it because it ceased to exist when it split. So something that had a future like ours was tragically denied it, so this is as bad as an adult dying. Uh, the cell dividing into two things, we should, every time you have identical twins, you should have a funeral for the original embryo because that no longer exists and lost a future like ours. That's stupid, right? That's a stupid implication. So if you don't want to say that, if you don't want to say that twinning is as bad as death, if you want to avoid a stupid implication, have I got a solution to the abortion problem for you? Because suppose you want to have an abortion and you catch it early enough. There is a, already a way of inducing twinning. They do it in uh, fertility clinics. They have zygotes and instead of harvesting more eggs from the mother, which is an expensive and um, stressful process. They have to flood her body with hormones. It's not a good thing for the mother to go through this. Um, I had a friend who died of aggressive cancer after going through IVF processes late in life, and they think it's because she had all these hormones to, to make egg production. Uh, so it's, it's not a, uh, it's, it, it's a, a uh, important thing that they're able to do this to save the mother. So they can make, they can twin, they can induce twinning in uh, fertility clinics already. Suppose somebody wants an abortion and catches it early enough. Here's what I do at my harmless abortion clinic. I say, okay, I'm going to uh, cause your embryo to twin. So I inject it with the twinning substance. But before it has a chance to twin, I then abort it. This is not wrong according to the new theory. Why isn't it wrong? Because the thing that I injected with twinning no longer has a future like ours because it's about to divide and as we've seen, if it divides, it no longer exists as an organism. And if it no longer exists as an organism, it doesn't have a future like ours. So, like the very old person, the account doesn't see anything wrong with killing it. There you go. You can have abortions without them being wrong, according to this new theory. Now, of course, you'd have to catch it early enough, but... Um, uh, the fact is, in theory, this should be possible. And given that it's possible in theory, that suggests that the having a future like ours is not really what matters. It's, uh, he must have fixated on something wrong. And Par uh, Derek Parfit argues that identity is not what matters for exactly the same reasons. He gives arguments that uh, uh, when you have what's called fission, it shouldn't be as bad as death. And uh, what makes it sound as if it's bad as death if you focus on identity. Also, there's a non-identity problem. I have another video on that that applies to the claim that you always have to have a victim. If you always have to have a victim, then um, you can't explain what's wrong with uh, like having a child. Like, we think that it would be wrong for somebody who, if they had a child, would have a short and nasty life. We think you shouldn't even conceive it. But the, the animalist theory can't explain what's wrong with that because before you conceive the child, there is no victim. So you're not doing anything wrong. So there are some commitments in this new theory that lead to paradoxical conclusions. 
answer to this question is no, it can't.